Um, today, we're going to focus on using e-state for multiple wills. And uh, although we've uh, dealt with this before, um, we're, uh, it's a constant uh, a question that people have, and uh, it's a powerful tool. So um, uh, I'm going to show it again. So here we go. Um, so the good thing about technology is um, it used to take us a lot longer to do a multiple will, and we had to double check cross references and other things, um, and uh, uh, make sure that we didn't make mistakes, things like that. It's much easier um, when we have technology using um, multiple wills, uh, uh, pretty straightforward and easy to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with just a typical um, uh, one, and um, we're going to make sure we've got enough assets. Okay, so let's just do a typical um, plan where it's, uh, you know, a spouse with younger kids, do a trust for the kids, that kind of thing. So I'm going to use my E plan to, uh, which is under here under the lightning bolt to create the, your basic plan of everything to the spouse, right? Uh, then to the kids in a trust, uh, et cetera. So, um, couple of things I want to add to this to this plan. One is that I want to let the kids, if if both both of the parents die, I want to let the kids use the cottage for a period of time. So I'm going to set up a cottage trust. And so I've dragged the asset in. I'm going to select a trust. Um, I'm going to say you can the kids can stay there until uh, they're all uh, 25, let's say. Um, but I'm also going to build in either they all agree uh, to sell it or trustee decides to sell it. So we're going to terminate the trust on those three conditions. We're going to have the estate pay the expenses. Um, and so we're going to do a pretty straightforward thing uh, there. Um, so now what I'm going to do is, you know, I've worked out the plan. Let's say one other thing that we're going to do here is um, let's just do this where we, uh, Give a cash gift uh, to the dad um, uh, of a thousand, a hundred thousand dollars if everyone's gone. Then the balance is being split between the siblings and the spouse's siblings. So here we have a pretty typical plan. Um, and whenever you finish the planning, I'm um, uh, going to point out a couple of things. One thing that I always like to do is I check my insights. So that's the exclamation point with the circle. I'm going to click that and I'm going to just refresh so I get the latest insights. And eState's going to go through all of the issues here and um, see if there's anything here that you think we should change um, or not. Um, there's a whole bunch of issues because we the Simpson family is very complicated, but in any event, um, uh, you know we've we've done this. Okay. So we've looked at our things. Yes, we're ready to go. So now we're going to generate the document and we're going to click on the documents tab. And uh, as you know, uh, you can generate this as a single will, as a multiple will, uh, et cetera. I'm going to pick multiple wills because that's what I'm showing you. So all you do to create multiple wills is you, um, and I'm going to do before I generate that, I'm going to just going to appoint an alternate. Um, I'm going to appoint a trust company as an alternate, just as an example. Um, if the spouse can't act, okay? So we'll just have two, that way we'll do that. Um, what else should we do? We'll add a guardian as well. Let's uh, add Heather as the guardian. That way we've got pretty much all of the things covered. Um, okay, good. So now we're gonna generate multiple wills. Now, a couple things, I'm gonna click on multiple wills. It's gonna start generating a preview. Now, for wills, for multiple wills, there are different options that you can select. Um, we're going to, we're not going to put in a signing date, but we could, if we wanted, if we knew the date we were signing this will, the 20th, we could put that in. Okay. Um, I'm not going to use a, I'll use a cover page. I'm going to include will guide. These are all typical ones for that you would see on any will, all of these. Okay. Um, I'm going to put in the witnesses, for example, and um, now. Uh, I'm going to include an affidavit. Again, these are all sort of standard ones. Um, so the one that comes up that's unique to multiple wills is the gift options here. And some lawyers like to put all uh, specific asset gifts. So if they're gifts of specific assets as opposed to residue, they like to put it in both wills. Um, 
eState will do that automatically unless for private company shares, if you want that only to be in the secondary will because you're 100% sure that no probate is ever going to be required for that, then you can have a gift of private company shares appear only in the secondary will. Okay. Um, so um, we have those options. And that's in when we're generating the document. Okay. There are other options to pick what assets are going to be defined in the primary and the secondary wills. So I'm going to show you where that is. Um, that's in provisions. So in provisions here, if we scroll all the way to the bottom, there's something that's called secondary will assets. So this is telling eState, what do we want to define as being secondary will uh, assets? Personal effects, yes. Specifically named corporations, yes. Unspecified corporate assets, what are those? Those are the general basket clause that says, you know, any other, pro any other uh, private company that I control, well, it could be I control or my spouse controls or my family controls, and you can identify what you want the definition to say in this using this box. And so I'm just gonna click all three. So any corporate assets that's either controlled by me, my spouse or my family uh, are gonna be covered by the secondary will. Um, registry system real estate are sort of first dealings properties. Trust assets are assets held on a bear trust or resulting trust for the testator. So if you're doing bear trust planning, um, you're putting things joint with kids or something, you're going to want to include the definition of trust assets in the secondary will because you want those to pass automatically. Um, lo trust loans are loans uh, from a trust that are owing. Non-arms length loans are loans um, that are owing to you by a spouse, children, et cetera. Um, other lives, life insurance, that's a life insurance owned by the testator, but on somebody else's life and then partnership interest. So whatever you're going to check off here is going to automatically get defined in both the primary and secondary wills as being part of the secondary will. So let's generate a preview here. And um, here is the will. So I'm going to skip. Obviously, it's going to put in the proper wording in the opening paragraph and all of those things. Um, so the proper revocation clause, all of those things. Let me show you where it's really different from a single will. It's really different from a single will when we start defining assets. So we define, for example, corporate assets. You'll see on the right here, we've asked it to define specifically named corporate assets. That's these three here. But here's the unspecified. So you can see it added I or my spouse or my family control. So that's also going to be covered in the definition of corporate assets, which are going to be governed by the secondary will, unless they're disclaimed. And I'll explain that in a second. Same with the trust assets, the registry, system real estate, trust loans, other life. All of these are the ones, because we've selected them from the provisions tab, they're going to appear here. Estate uses the concept of the possibility of a disclaimed asset. So if an asset would have fallen into the secondary will, into the secondary estate, but for whatever reason requires probate, you can. This gives the authority to the uh, to the executors to disclaim an asset from the secondary will, have it pass into the primary will, and be governed by that. That is one of the reasons, although not the main reason, that you will see any specific gift, a gift of a house, a gift of uh, you know real estate generally, um, gift of bank accounts, that is going to appear both in the primary will and in the secondary will, but only to the extent that it's that, that asset forms part of the particular will. And I'll show you where I am with that in a moment. So um, this just defines what's in the primary estate and what's in the secondary estate, and they always match. So whatever is being excluded from one is being included in the other. So they're gonna cover all of your assets. Um, I wanna just go to this point where uh, we talk about a specific asset. So. Here, if you recall, we made a, a, a trust for the cottage. Now, we don't know, and this applies to real estate uh, especially, but it's, it applies to any specific asset. We think we might, we have a good guess on what which will this is going to be in, okay? For example, if this was a registry system piece of real estate um, and it would qualify for first dealings, 
mostly we, we would know that we would think that it's going to be in the secondary will. But things happen like a transfer that re revokes that first dealing exemption or a change in the law or something else. And if we only put it in the will, the gift in the will that we think the asset's going to fall into, and the asset doesn't fall into that will because for whatever reason, probate is necessary, for example, then we've created a, uh, I think we're, we might be negligent and we created a problem because the asset's governed by one will, but the gift is in the raw, in the other will. So that's why you'll see in every case, except private company shares and personal effects, you'll see those appear in both wills, okay? And you'll see the way it talks about it. It, it, it basically only covers to the extent that it forms part of the primary estate. And the secondary will will have exactly the same provision, but it's going to say to the extent it forms part of the secondary estate. Um, we strongly recommend that, especially for real estate and the use of bear trusts, an asset that you might expect will definitely need probate, like a condominium, ends up being held on a bear trust and is governed by the secondary will. And now you've got the gift of the condo or a trust for the condo in the wrong will. And so that's why we draft it this way. And that's as a result of a bunch of law pro claims, um, to be honest with you. And so that's why we do it that way. The one exception, as I pointed out, was you have the choice for private company shares. Because we got a lot of, this is where we listened to, <laughs> to our users. Um, we had a lot of pushback that people only wanted to see a gift of private company shares in the secondary will. So we give you that option. If I put it here, it will. The, if I make a gift of a private company share, it will only appear in the secondary will. It won't appear in both. If I pick primary and secondary, any specific gift of a of private company shares will appear in both. Okay, so that's a, a an important uh, option, and it's a preference. So you could set it at your firm level. If your firm always likes private company share gifts only in the secondary will, then then you'll set up your precedent that way and it'll always appear that way. And then you could change it if you had any reason to do that in a particular client just by going in here. Um, I'm just gonna demonstrate that for a second here. So I think I've got a, pri yeah, I do have some private company shares. So let's give away the private company shares, okay? So um, let's give away the private company shares uh, uh, to Abe. Um, and now when we reload this, the gift will only be the gift of the private company shares, and I'll show you that in a moment, will be in the secondary will um, because that's what I've told it to do. So if I go down here to the secondary will, I'll see the gift here of the shares, okay? It's only in, it's only in the secondary will. We also change the, we, we make the name uh, the one, two, three, the name of the corporation, interest, okay? Why do we do that? Well, in the definition section, we want to cover more than just the shares of that company. We likely want to cover um, uh, not only the shares of the company, but for example, shareholder loans, okay? Or if those shares are converted into another share, we want the gift a lot to continue. So what we do, eState automatically defines it here, um, in the definition section to be the name of corporation interest. So whenever it sees a specific gift of shares of a company, uh, an absolute gift, then it's going to call it the, whatever name of the corporation is, interest. And that's how we make sure we cover, because if you only said my shares in one, two, three, it wouldn't cover shareholder loans. It wouldn't cover shares that are converted, et cetera. And so that's why we do it that way. Um, so uh, we do that. Um, the other, uh, so I just want to point out how you deal with that. People ask me all the time where, um, uh, uh, whether, for example, um, you want to give, we, you want to give just the shares away and should they, why can't I create a different residue, uh, provision in the secondary will, because the secondary will is going to only cover, um, my shares in the company. Okay. We don't recommend that. And eState's not built to do that for, for good reason. We don't know what's going to be in the residue of the secondary will. And that is not the proper way in, in our view and uh, to give away sh uh, shares. If you want to give away shares, then do it as a specific gift. 
you can it'll be done in the secondary well that's fine and maybe maybe you're right maybe the only asset in the secondary well is going to be those shares in the company that's fine well if that's the case then you're, you're you've done what you had to do anyway it's when people guess on what's going to be in the residue i'm going to give the residue of my secondary will to this person and my we don't support that and we don't think that's a good way of drafting so if you ever have a situation where client says, I want my shares of this company, this company, this company, or whatever it might be to go to this person. Don't have it fall into the residue of a secondary estate. Deal with it as a specific gift. Okay. That's how estates built. And we stand behind that. And if you want to do it a different way, you're free to do it. Of course, you can uh, draft it manually, but we don't provide for different residues because we don't think that's a good idea. Um, just another point. Um, if, um, Estate automatically doesn't duplicate cash gifts. If you remember, we made a little cash gift. Um, and so what um, Estate did was it put it in the primary will, and then it automatically put in a clause that says, in the secondary will, it says, if there's abatement in the primary will, which means there's not enough money to satisfy that gift, then satisfy it out of, uh, out of the secondary estate. And so it does that automatically. You don't have to remember to do that. Um, it'll do that for any initial gift, cash gift, um, whether it's in, regardless of what scenario it's in. Um, so that's uh, that's how Estate does it automatically and helps us avoid, because we don't know what's going to be in what um, will and if there's going to be enough money to pay legacies. But what we do do is we put them in the primary will first, and then we um, and then we have a uh, uh, basically an ability to cover the costs of those or the fund those legacies if the primary will is insufficient. Um, so that's, um, you know, basically how Estate works uh, for multiple wills. And it really shouldn't take you any more time to generate multiple wills as it does to generate single wills. Um, and yet we can charge, uh, you know, I think we when we did our survey, we saw that people are charging $1,000 or more for the same plan, but using uh, multiple wills. Well, for like I said, for Estate uh, shouldn't take you any more time and uh, um, and you should be able to do that no problem. Um, uh, so what does Estate do for double legacies and spouse wills? So Estate uh, automatically, so if it sees matching legacies, okay, it will automatically put in a clause. So it checks, okay, that's the first thing. Um, and, and I'll just show you a feature that ties into this. If I do my comp spouse compare here, that's this button. Um, I will see that there's all kinds of problems here. For example, one of the problems that the, the two two gifts, the, the two wills don't match, uh, Marge and Homer's. One of the differences is the client only. So Homer is the, has a hundred thousand dollar gift that that Marge doesn't have. So we would not see the double legacy um, wording in this. However, if two if the both spouses have the same gift, then what Estate does, and I'll just demonstrate that for a second. Descendants only. So let's say they're making a cash gift if both people are gone to Daniel Walker uh, for a, a dollar, okay? Um, and let's just sync this so we, we've got this right. So um, now both of them have this cash gift. Homer has the cash gift and you'll see Marge has the cash gift. Cash gift. What happens is Estate will automatically see, oh, the, two, the spouse and the client have the same matching uh, uh, initial gift. Um, and, and so what they'll do is they'll put in a clause right here that says this will directs to pay amounts and then it references the paragraph specifically. And it'll say, so, if, and my wife's will or my spouse's will has, has the same provision. If we die together, I want you to make sure it doesn't get paid twice. So it does that automatically. You don't have to worry about that. But it's only going to do that if it sees that it's the exact same gift. If you're making different gifts, it's not going to reference those other gifts. Um, if a client wants to name different executors, uh, there's a good question. Um, so we don't uh, we don't support um, naming different executors in the primary and secondary will. Uh, we know it does happen and people do it. We don't really want to encourage it because we think it causes a lot of issues. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we don't. But um, you would have to do that manually um, if you want to name two you know, different executors uh, for primary and secondary will. Obviously, you're going to want to make sure you think through issues of 
you know, what happens if there's a disagreement about debts and, um, and things like that. Um, the other way to do it is to have just a special executor for, and this is gonna be a topic actually, and something we're developing right now with these data is the use of special executors to deal with certain assets. Um, we, we used to see it a lot, uh, what were called literary executors. So where the client was, uh, for example, an author, uh, and they wanted somebody special to deal with their publishing rights and all of those things. They'd appoint a special executor to deal just with those assets called a literary executor. And now we're seeing that, we're seeing people want to do that with digital assets, um, sometimes with corporate assets and things like that. And so that's one of the things we're going to be building is um, the ability to appoint a specific executor for certain assets. Um, uh, so, um, you know, that's uh, that's something that if you want to Google something on that, it's called literary executors. Um, and we don't support that yet, but it's going to be coming because we're seeing, although it was so rare when I started practice, it's we're seeing the usefulness of it as, as assets become more and more complicated uh, and require sort of specialized uh, uh, knowledge, um, you know, art collections and things like that. Of course, an executor can always hire the people they need, but uh, we're finding that more and more people are thinking about appointing a special executor. That always creates conflict because you've got two different people responsible for different things. Uh, so our law isn't that great on that, to be honest with you. There's not a lot of law on it. Um, but anyway, that's something. Um, if you're dealing with shares in a professional corp, must the name executor own the same license? So um, what we often do is uh, have a provision in the will that appoints an executor uh, with respect to my legal practice, uh, and it's a named, uh, you know, it's a lawyer, for example, or my, and if that person doesn't want to do it, then uh, some other lawyer licensee of the law society with authority to take on. So um, you don't, you see that from time to time as well. That's an example of a special executor. Um, and then, uh, and then use a, a, a regular executor for the rest of your assets. So um, those are uh, great questions. That's a whole other a whole other uh, seminar is how to deal with uh, you know lawyers uh, and their wills. Um, so those are the uh, uh, are there clauses for reproductive material? So we don't yet have um, uh, great clauses for that. Um, the The idea for you, know, you have to look carefully, and we've done some webinars on it. Um, there's a, a a bunch of consents that are required uh, in writing. Um, before you can use uh, genetic material. Um, BC actually has a very good, uh, 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 has, has some good work on that whole area. Um, and it's certainly something that we're gonna, we're gonna build uh, into eState. It's not something that we, um, we have right now in a very uh, good way, but if, um, Mandeep, if, uh, if you have questions, I can send you what I have and, uh, and see if that helps. Um, but it is on our roadmap, like many, many things. <laughs> it's about getting its priorities, right? So um, right now, although reproductive material is more common, it's not an everyday occurrence where you're trying to give it away. So so, um, so that's what I had to discuss. Are there any questions on multiple wills? Feel free to um, unmute. And if you just want to chime in, you can do that. It might be Brody um, that 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 typically um, uh, insurance companies don't need probate uh, for other lives life insurance, um, but it depends, and that's why we have the disclaimer clause, and that's why you'd want to give it maybe try it in the secondary will and then disclaim it if it if the insurance company um, needed uh, needed probate to transfer it. All right. Um, this Thursday, uh, Ian uh, is uh, leading the charge with Susanna for our webinar. Um, and so if you can make it, uh, that's great. I don't know if any of you are going to the solo and small um, uh, solo and small practice uh, law society um, uh, seminar on Thursday, but we'll be there and I'll be there. And uh, so that's great. Um, we don't do tertiary wills uh, in Estate. Um, we don't really 
think they're necessary anymore uh, after the Milne decision. Uh, we think that the drafting works this way. Uh, the only time you might see tertiary wills is where you had foreign uh, a will um, uh, for foreign assets, um, but E-State doesn't uh, do tertiary wills. Um, we got enough problems trying to do multiple wills. <laughs> to, to, uh, it gets even more complicated when you do tertiary, and we don't we don't see that that often. So maybe one day after reproductive material. <laughs> Uh, and a host of other things. Um, so that's that. Um, thanks so much for joining us. I uh, hope to see you again um, next week and uh, hope that you join us on Thursday and uh, take care and feel, feel free as you guys know, if you're an eState user, you just click on the help button and type in your question or get some live chat uh, with, uh, with Michaela and the rest of our support team there. And we're on duty and we're here to help. And we'd love feedback and uh, as we uh, we build out eState to be even more and more powerful. So thanks everybody and um, be well. Take care.